am a copywriter, a, a brand builder, um, a fiction writer, and my territory is pop culture and digital. And I guess I started out as a copywriter, as a traditional copywriter, and I entered the industry at a time where social and digital were just coming into the market as something to be taken notice of. Um, I have always also aspired to be a fiction writer, so in the background I was also writing stories um, and at the time blogs came along and there came um, this platform where you could kind of publish something instantly and start telling stories instantly, which to an aspiring novelist seemed like, uh, you know, kind of crack cocaine. So uh, that's where I kind of started telling stories in sort of medium form, which was like uh, figure out personas and kind of figure out um, uh, ideas that were not necessarily true stories, but I could put them online and get an audience and kind of engage with people instantly. Um, and also engage with brands. And so this was kind of my history and this is kind of where I come from. I have worked in the fields of kind of branding and influence for, and, and these are the three main companies that have had an influence on the kind of influential sphere of my career. Instant Brass, I used to work as basically a branded spy when I was a student. Like I used to get paid by brands to go to parties and take note of what people were wearing, what they were drinking. I used to get given a camera, and I used to go out and take photos of them. And I would be like, oh, a whole bunch of girls are drinking this new drink, or a whole bunch of guys are wearing these shirts. And I would send it in and I'd get paid 150 rand for my insights. Later on, that kind of grew into a thing called seeding, which was viral, where the reverse would happen. So brands would give instant grass products, give it to us kids. They'd pay us 150 rand to then go and drink Hunter's Dry in public. Of course, this is all kind of very vague ethically, and none of it was really like done above board. And, but this was kind of this beginning of influencer marketing, and was I, and um, it was also before things were very um, sort of instantly publishable online. King James is kind of where I got my uh, creative grounding, and it's where I got my branding background. Um, and I spent a lot of time jumping in and out of this agency. Um, I, I learned the basics in terms of um, big branding, in terms of through the line disciplines. Um, and they were very kind of quite open to the new digital world and they allowed me to do this thing called blogging and they allowed me to experiment with the social media world until they didn't anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so while I was at King James I started writing this blog called My Branded Life. Um, and it was a blog about, now this was in 2007, 2006, and what was happening was I was on the internet like a total nerd, um, most people were out and about kind of living their lives because no one was living their lives on the internet yet, except for me, um, and a few other friends like Kai Langer, he was online, Ian Thomas, he was online as well, he's become kind of quite a famous internet poet. Um, Lauren Bukas, she was also online, and anyway, I was kind of online and I was watching brands in the States and overseas start to work with influencers and watching them kind of start to live these branded lives. And already at this point, I'd seen so much of it that I was able to get jaded about it. So I would write this blog in 2007, 2008 called My Branded Life, which I'm going to read you an extract from. Now, please believe me when I say I did not want to get attention with this blog. I was not looking for followers, likes, or clicks from brands or anyone. I was writing this for myself. And you can see because I kind of wrote it like an idiot would write it. I am a blogger, y'all. In the beginning was just me and WordPress. Just wanted to write outside of work. Just wanted to develop a discipline I could apply to my novel in progress. Just wanted to make others out there feel less alone while copy checking financial reports slash advertorials slash pushing a two cent coin around the gaps in the checkers spreads. Any art directors who work at 99 cents here? No? Okay. I uh, just wanted to pay homage to God via blog God hipster runoff, but life finds a way. Miss you John Hammond, miss you Jurassic Park, could you get geekier references? Um, and even though my blog was created female, it changed sex and mated with itself to create a life of its own. Shazam y'alls, just like that. So I was writing this weird ass blog and it got attention from like creative people, it got attention from advertising people and it got enough attention for um, my, my boss is at King James to wonder whether it was actually a good thing. And they, and they said to me that 
they thought it might be disrespecting advertising and that it might not really be portraying myself or the agency in the best light. And I had a choice. I could quit the blog or lose my job. So um, I obviously chose my job because I was young and, and quite committed to my job and I didn't want to lose my job. I didn't set out to do that. But I had, had, I had a following at the time. And, I was, and I'd been approached by brands to work with them and brands had wanted to get involved. But because this blog was very sarcastic and quite, quite dark, I thought, okay, well, let me rebrand or let me see if I can rebrand. And that's where this kind of quite, someone once described it as vacuous, offensively vacuous, Cape Town Girl came apart about. But what Cape Town Girl was, was really the online equivalent of Cosmo, and that's what a lot of blogs were at the time. Um, uh, sorry, just sorry, no, 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 not the equivalent of Cosmo, but they were, they were doing what magazines were not doing at the time, which is adapting to the way the medium worked. And Cape Town was kind of like a Cosmo. It was a generic female lifestyle platform that brands could work with in a very easy way. So it became very accessible for brands to work with. I could tweet and indulge my uh, fashion, shallow, cooking side, and brands could work with me, and we could kind of have an exchange going. And I was able to replace my income for two years while doing this until the era of blogs died. Um, and that is when traditional media caught up with what bloggers were doing so well, which was being agile and quick and able to report in the moment and um, making the, the kind of reporting experience personal. But what I've learned out of all these kind of years of being um, an influencer um, across various things. So Cape Town Girl gave me amazing access. Shall I just go back to the Kardashians, where we look at me with the Kardashians? Okay, anyway, so Cape Town Girl gave me amazing access to a world I'd never had access to before and never thought I wanted to have access to before. It gave me a, an access to a world of um, launches and parties and new products and new experiences and limited experiences and secret previews and behind the scenes stuff that I would never have had access to unless I was an A-lister or very rich or um, in some way kind of connected to a brand. And as someone working continuously and through the line advertising, this was fantastic because it was market research. I got to see what all my competitor brands were doing, what they were doing at launches, how they were kind of uh, talking to their markets, how they were engaging with their customers, and I could see how to do it better for my own clients. What I learned is that, yeah, brands build influencers as much as influencers build brands. I don't know why I just did that. Um, so, in the States, this is something that's very, very clear. This is something I write about in my book, almost as a given, and that is that in this country, we kind of, when we think about influencers and influencer marketing, we think as brands, what can the influencer do for me? But what we've really got to think about is how can this work for both parties? And how can I take, how can the influencer take my brand to the next level, and how can I take the influencer's uh, kind of project and interest to the next level as well? Um, Lauren Bukas wrote a book, this is now 10 years old, Moxie Land. Um, and one of the story threads in Moxie Land involves an artist who is too poor to be an artist unless she signs up for a lifetime branded sponsorship with an energy drink. Um, which is the case with most artists. I mean, they, we do kind of have to sign up for some sort of sponsorship at some point. Um, the energy drink is called Ghost, and uh, if she signs up with it, she, it comes with some benefits, namely she can afford to do art, they will support her. Um, the only catch is that it's a voluntary addiction, so she'll be addicted to this energy drink for life, and she gets a glowing blue tattoo on her arm, and whenever she's low on the energy drink, the tattoo glows and she has to go drink some more. However, there are some very, very big branded sort of free benefits that come with this brand, which is um, it makes you live forever and it cures you of AIDS. And I mean, these are the only kinds of really free branded benefits that actually count as an influencer. And if you as a, as a brand aren't offering like a cure to AIDS, you've got to actually kind of invest in your influencers and look at, their, and look at ways to improve them and kind of facilitate you know, their interests and their goals and their dreams as much as, you know, you can't just dump, as Fred and I were chatting earlier, brands just tend to kind of dump a box of their product on your desk or they send you a pack of their stuff and they just expect you to 
kind of do something with it, or they, or they just want you to use it, and they want you to talk about it, and they, or they'll say, oh, we'll send you 1,500 Rand, or we'll pay you 2,000 Rand if you write a post about it, and that's not an investment, you know, that's not, it's not uh, going to get anybody anywhere. So, I mean, that was kind of the biggest thing I learned out, out of it, is that as a brand, you've got to kind of take responsibility for building your influencer as much as the influencer is building your brand. At the moment, I'm kind of working at Woody's. Uh, we do, in fashion, we work in a lot of, uh, with a lot of influencers because fashion is about people and um, obviously influencers lend, lend themselves well to this category. Style by I say was a competition where, which we ran where we invited the country to upload their looks with the hashtag Style by SA, and we selected people out of the whole country to kind of start, to start the new campaign. Um, and this is something we do on an ongoing basis. If, um, this hashtag now has kind of grown and grown and grown, and we keep picking people out and featuring them in the campaign, which has kind of worked quite well for us. And then <coughs> another kind of important thing with influencers are shared values. I mean, Mike's going to do all the heavy lifting in the next influencer talk, but the only thing I'm going to say now is that with the Pharrell Williams campaign, what's been great is that he, you know, we decided to work with him because he's done so much work in sustainability worldwide. He's someone who won't put on a Woolies outfit and say, I'm with Woolworths. He in fact won't even wear the Woolworths clothes. He, he wanted to go into a collaboration with the brand to create t-shirts using his fabric Bionic Yarn, which is made with recycled um, sort of plastic. So it's really is about finding someone who's going to work with you and take your product or company to the next level, which gives you a story to talk about. Um, and now here's my story that I'm going to talk about. So I wrote this book about two years ago um, and it's about an influencer slash blogger and uh, he is called Jacob Lynch um, and also known as Brody Lomax online and he is a it's been yeah he is what we call a revenge porn blogger so it's been called Stephen King for the Age of Social Media, a twisted tour through the depths of modern desperation for fame and affirmation. That's quite accurate. Um, and the gist of the story is a person often meets his destiny on the road he took to avoid it. Now Jacob is a blogger. He starts his blog at the time when it was still possible to start a blog and then a brand would identify you and you'd suddenly get big and you'd get a million followers and then you'd be big overnight. So he kind of catches that window. And uh, he starts his blog with vague intentions, which um, I talk a bit more about later. Um, but in the beginning, the setup is that he's living the life, he's rich, he's famous, he's got a reality show and all he's got to do is finish writing his book and then he can kind of retire, quit the blogging thing, and escape this kind of world he's living in, which is a world of excess. He's drinking, he's drugging, he's partying, um, and it's kind of getting all too much for him. So off he goes, he, he gets an email, as bloggers do, um, inviting him to come and stay in a luxury hunting lodge in Alaska, and he accepts the invitation because as a blogger, he thinks there's nothing odd about receiving an invitation to come and stay somewhere luxurious for free, because bloggers get those invitations all the time. And uh, so off he goes. But uh, there's someone waiting for him there in Alaska, and that someone is waiting to take revenge on him. Um, the book is a thriller, so I can't really talk too much about it, but I'm going to talk around some of the, uh, the themes and kind of inspirations for the novel. Um, what's really important in this in the story is location. So he it's set in New York and it's set in this life of excess and kind of he's always snorting cocaine or he's always coming down from cocaine or he's always drinking. And off he goes into Alaska, which is white, 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 and it's snow. And what's most important is there's no Wi-Fi signal, so he can't get the constant affirmation and the drug that is his phone and which is the likes and his followers that has kind of become his his main source of, um, I don't know, identity for himself. So the, I said between New York and Alaska because he needs this kind of clean break from his main drug, which is uh, social media. Um, who he is himself, he's kind of based on a slut whisperer, you know, like Carol or Dan Bilderian. So he's very much portrays this male, hard partying lifestyle, um, uh, bitches and beer, tits and guns. And he's kind of a poster boy for this idea that on the internet, evil pays better. 
you know, we were chatting about that earlier as well, Fred, about how on the internet negative stuff gets so much more traction than positive stuff. You know, if you want an audience, start a fight. And in his case, he becomes so, so famous because he realizes that the more controversial stuff he posts, the more attention he gets. So he starts his blog as being quite innocuous, it's quite kind of bro blogger, men's health with a twist kind of stuff. But the more misogynistic he gets and the more um, kind of degrading about around women he gets, the more the feminists protest him and the more they kind of retweet him and get angry about him, the more attention he gets. So he realizes very quickly that the worse of a person he can be online, the more attention he'll get. He also, because he's, he's chasing attention, he's losing himself. So there's this idea that I explore where, I mean the idea of losing yourself or other people's approval is not something new and it's something we deal with on a day to day basis, but on the internet it's never ever been more prevalent than ever because you can actually kind of, uh, forgo, you can, you can lose yourself for the opinions of people you've never ever met. And in his instance, he kind of sells his soul for the opinions and likes and shares of people he will never ever ever meet. But those opinions and likes and shares are his currency. They earn him money, clicks equals cash. So, you know, he's kind of desperately caught up in this chase for likes. And in the process, he, he puts aside who he really is and his real values. Um, I also explore the theme of real self versus projected self. And this is something that all of us experience online. Uh, now, some of us do it very consciously, some of us don't do it consciously, and I think some people don't even realize they're doing it, you know? We're all projecting an image of ourselves online. There is a big difference between your Facebook persona and who you really are. Um, and he, he, in his mind, believes there's a difference between this asshole persona he's created, or this Frankenstein of a monster he's created, and who he really is. But what this woman who takes revenge on him tries to point out to him is that if the consequences of the actions of his persona are real and caused by him, then is there really a difference? So it asks some very difficult questions, which might make you think. Um, there's also this, this theme of kind of tacit compliance. Uh, social media, are we frogs in water? You know, there's the whole metaphor of the frog sitting in the pot of water and then we, if you boil, you turn the heat up, they'll slowly boil because they don't realize that the water's getting hotter and hotter and hotter. And we're all kind of signing up to Facebook, signing up to the next social media platform. So we think we're doing it for ourselves or our businesses or our, um, you know, our Kickstarter group thing that we want to start. But we're actually making Mark Zuckerberg richer. We're making the CEOs of Twitter richer. We're making these other people richer. And particularly with, um, with Jacob's point of view is that he, he uses this, um, there's a reality show within, his, within, his, within, the, blog, within the novel and he, he justifies consumers getting involved in his reality show without them realizing it by saying that if people know, if, uh, he's famous enough for people to know that if they get involved with him or if they're seen with him, they should realize they're going to be in a reality show with him. So he kind of uses this tacit compliance thing, i.e. if you upload a photo to Facebook, you should know that it might be used for bad purposes somewhere down the line, even if it's only within the next 10 years. So it explores that notion as well, like the, I, this Ashley Madison thing. If Ashley Madison was hacked, it really is just a matter of time before all our private Facebook chats are hacked. And I don't know, it's something to think about. The road to hell is paved with vague intentions. Um, like I've said before, he doesn't necessarily start out trying to be a bad guy and wanting to start this kind of misogynist blog. But um, as Justine Sacco knows when she got off her airplane and had tweeted that tweet very loosely, and um, you know, you can just be vague on the internet and not have a clear intention and you can completely ruin your life. Now Frankenstein, Victor Frankenstein, in the original Frankenstein book had a similar thing. He just got very excited about technology and he hacked a body together from a corpse and then next thing it was a monster which haunted the rest of his days and killed everyone he loved. Um, the same thing might happen from a persona or a tweet that you tweet or a website that you start. You just have no idea what this thing is going to do that you, you put out there and it's just almost too easy to put stuff out there. So he puts out this persona called Brody Lomax which he thinks is quite a bit of a joke and it's a bit of a lol and uh, it's, it's going to be, you know, this, 
he doesn't really know what he's going to do with it, but it ends up becoming way bigger than he ever thought it would be, and way bigger than him, and it ends up ruining his life completely. And then throughout the novel as well, there's a wolf. Um, <laughs> the wolf talks, uh, or does it, and, uh, and this is something you've kind of got to decide, um, but it's a metaphor, and ultimately there's kind of a, it's, there's a bit of a sort of switcheroo in your hair. You have to figure out who's actually the villain and who isn't. But the wolf is sort of a source of truth, which appears as something dangerous and scary and frightening and the horror and the horror story in the beginning. But as you read on, you very quickly realize that the horror and the scary part is something very, very different. And the wolf is actually the truth. And sometimes truth does appear as something quite scary and terrifying and yeah. And then this, I'm going to end off with the quote that I start the book with, which is, we make our own monsters, and then they fear, and then fear them for what they show us about ourselves. And this is kind of how I feel about the whole internet. A lot of the time, if you, if you watch what people get enraged about online daily, I mean, if you just take the big pen thing, for example, um, so many people kind of got up in arms about the big pen. How could we say, act like a lady, think like a man? wear a hat like a horse or whatever. And everyone got so enraged with big pens. I mean, this poor social media manager who put that big pens post up, God bless her and her children, whoever, whatever happened to her that night. But the truth is that, that act like a lady, think like a man, is a piece of popular culture that's been sitting around in, in bookstores and movies for 15 years. And it's been tweeted and condoned and liked and loved and passed around. It's, it's, a, it's a man's self-help book. Um, written by comedian Steve Harvey. But nobody got angry with Steve Harvey when he walked around telling women to act like a lady and think like a man, you know? Like, nobody screamed at that. And that's been an acceptable part of society for now 15 years. And then Big had to kind of recontextualize and slap it on their own photo and it became this kind of disaster. But the internet really just holds up a mirror and we get so angry at what it shows us.